Hi, a very warm welcome to ESG Virtual Wellness Series, Men's Health, Heart and Fast Truth. My name is Fadil Irham and I am your moderator. We have a list of activities planned out for you from exciting contests and exhibitables where you can learn more about your, our sponsors. There will also be a one-on-one Q&A from 1.30 to 2.30. So do head down to the booth and reach out to the speakers through the meet function on the platform. Finally, do stand a chance to win prizes when you participate in the activities throughout the events um, and look out for the leaderboard menu icon to see how you can earn points for our top three winners. Before I begin, um, here are some housekeeping uh, moves. During this session, slides will be shared. If you wish to make the screen larger, just, um, just click on the full screen um, at the optimized button on the right side of the screen at any point of time. If you have any questions for the speaker, I would encourage you to submit them on the Q&A um, portion on the right side of your screen. Uh, we will try our best to answer as many as possible. All right, so first up, we are joined by Dr. Lean Kok Bin, a consultant urologist from Raffles Urology Center. Dr. Lim has a particular interest in prostate disease, voiding dysfunction, male infertility, and sexual dysfunction. He has been awarded the prize essay in clinical research for his work on Pyrenees disease. Today, you'll learn the truths about most common myths on men's health and get some advice on improving overall health and fitness. So, Dr. Lim, please. Hi, everyone. For all those guys, uh, in front of your desktop or laptop. Um, I hope you have a good morning today. Uh, for today, we are going to have a white banner on men's general health and fitness. My name is Scott Bin. I'm a urologist. Now, for us, we deal with mainly issues with the urinary tract. Uh, but for today, we're going to focus only on two urological conditions. Now, commonest health problems faced by men in Singapore are namely cancer and vascular conditions like diabetes, heart disease, and stroke. Of the list of cancer, the number two killer is actually prostate cancer, which is one of the things that we do on a daily basis. But however, we're not going to deal on prostate cancer today. Our focus will be the two most common conditions, prostate enlargement and erectile dysfunction. Now, first thing I would like to elaborate first uh, is the prostate gland, because some of you might not know what it is. Although it causes urinary tract symptoms, the gland itself is actually a sexual organ. It's situated right in front of your rectum where the feces go through and just beneath the bladder. Now, its function is to provide nutrition to the sperm. Unfortunately, the problem with prostate is that it goes larger as the man gets older. Theoretically, almost 50% of men, once they reach the age of 50, has a chance of getting a new tract symptoms so what happens is that you can see from this slide right the prostate is down below the bladder and larges constrict the urethra the urine passage causing problem with urination as a result okay the bladder had to work harder and because of that the bladder wall muscle also thickens which is not good why because the space will become smaller and that's when you also experience frequent urination what are the symptoms that you might face when you're having this problem? As I said before, frequent urination, a frequent urge to want to go to the toilet, it could be happening the daytime or nighttime. You might have difficulty starting the urination or difficulty to actually urinate at all. Uh, the string will be slow. You might not be have a good ending, it dribbles. And some of this uh, situation might worsen developing urine tract infection, and sometimes blood in the urine. Now, what are the risk factors um, that causes prostate enlargement? Age, unfortunately, as I said before, is one of those things that face all men as they get older. If you're a person who doesn't do much physical activity, resulting in a higher body mass index, uh, really very sedentary lifestyle, you do put yourself at risk getting prostate enlargement. And of course, if there's a family history, strong family history of prostate enlargement, where the grandfathers, the uncles, and the fathers are all having prostate enlargement, chances are you might get it one day. So how do we diagnose prostate can, uh, enlargement? Now, first of all, of course, we ask about the urinary symptoms. We may also actually ask how your bowel habits are because constipation actually worsens the symptom. 
we might do some urine tests. As I said before, you know, you might be having an infection. And then there were simple tests like how fast or how strong your pee is. We do a urine flow test. And in order to exclude prostate cancer, uh, especially in men uh, above the age of 50, uh, we will do a blood test called the PSA. But essentially, with all the tests I mentioned, a critical component of the uh, diagnosis is physical examination, where we have to do a rectal exam. That's when we can feel the prostate gland by putting our finger into the rectum. And we can feel whether it is regularly enlarged or it was small, is it smooth, is it hard, is there any lumps that you know can be felt? And that gives us a, some form of idea of what's happening. Of course, that's not enough, especially in this day of age where we have scientific improvement. So we go on to do simple tests like ultrasound scan of the bladder, where you can see how the bladder looks like, whether it's thickened, how the size of the prostate gland, we can measure actually the size of the prostate gland. In situation where there's a bit of a you know a dilemma, then we might proceed to do a flexible cystoscopy where we introduce a small tube into the bladder and have a look inside to find out more the reason uh, of the urination problem. Only if there's a, a worry about cancer, then we may do ultrasound scan and biopsy the prostate gland. But essentially, most of the time, an ultrasound scan of the bladder is suffice. Uh, what are the treatments that we can do uh, to help to alleviate the symptoms? One of the things would be to change some of your habits, like let's say, for example, if you're drinking like 10 cups of coffee a day, that could be something you can cut down because caffeine tends to irritate your bladder and causes you to have frequent urination. Uh, others would be like alcoholic drinks that also causes a lot of diuresis. Um, in terms of medical treatment, we have two main medicines uh, available to, to help with patients having this problem. One would be the group called alpha blocker. What it does is that it relaxes the bladder muscle as well as the muscle fibers around the prostate gland, allowing the urine to flow easier. The other group will be a far alpha reductase inhibitors where it shrink the prostate gland by doing some hormonal changes. And in severe situation, we will do a combination treatment where we give both alpha blocker and far alpha reductase inhibitors to give a combined effect in reducing those symptoms that they face. But sometimes medical treatment might not help or it does, but still having quite a number of residual problems. In this case, then we may have to proceed to the second level of treatment, uh, namely the non-surgical treatment, such as uh, microwave therapy, needle abrasion, uh, Botox injection, and prostate artery embolization. The advantage of this treatment is that they are less invasive. You probably could have the procedure done on the same day and go home the same day. There's no need to insert a urine catheter after the procedure. Uh, the disadvantage, of course, the timeline of benefit might be a bit shorter, maybe eight, 10 years. So what are the gold standards uh, treatment uh, available for prostate enlargement? Now, the traditional surgical treatment will be your TURP or transurethral resection of prostate prostate gland, which I'll elaborate later. Now, if the prostate is a bit small, not that large, we can just do an incision. Now, there's many ways of doing it, okay? A lot of times we use electric current, but you can use lasers, and very rarely uh, we do open surgery nowadays. So what is transurethral resection of prostate gland? Essentially, we do a endoscopy of the prostate gland. At the end of this endoscope, there's a electric wire that help us to cut away the prostate tissue that is blocking the urethra. At the same time, this electrical wire will also seal the blood vessel, reducing bleeding. Then all this tissue that's cut away will be flushed into the bladder and later on, at the end of the procedure, we use equipment to evacuate all this tissue out. So one of the things, or maybe a disadvantage, is that you do have to need a catheter, a urine catheter inside for one or two days to make sure that the bleeding stops to make sure you uh, recover from the surgery because some of the person who had the surgery done may not be able to pee straight away after the operation. So a couple of days of catheter will help to reduce the inflammation and swelling as a result of the surgery. Um, and because of the catheter, you might be in the hospital for two to three days. Now, um, later on, my colleague will elaborate further those uh, non-surgical methods which will allow day surgery procedure to carry out. 
Next, I will go on to talk about erectile dysfunction, the second most common uh, condition that face uh, by urologists. So what is erectile dysfunction? Now, essentially, it is the uh, inability for you to get an erection, or sometimes you could get an erection, but you could not maintain them hard enough to complete the entire sexual intercourse. And it's actually quite common. Essentially, I think about one in five men will have this problem, but the problem is it actually gets worse as you age. So this is a chart showing that, you know, the incidence of the or prevalence of the condition as you get older. Not only that, if you look at the blue bar, what which means complete your adult dysfunction, that portion also increases as you get older. So in other words, as you get older, you get this problem and you get worse form of this problem. So what are the risk factors? It's, an, it, it's still the, almost the same as uh, prostate enlargement where you have sedentary lifestyle and poor dieting. But other issues like smoking and medical conditions such as blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, or anything that involves the uh, blood supply or blood circulation will affect the chances of getting erectile dysfunction. And we don't forget that in erectile dysfunction, there's always an element of psychological issues. So stress from work, from family, from wife, anyone you have uh, will make it worse. It may not cause it, but it will make it worse. Or if you're essentially a very anxious person and then you have a problem with this erection, the, the, the anxiety as a result of that, the stress that comes with the fact that you're not able to perform will worsen that. Now, the treatment are, uh, first of all, uh, important in trying to get rid of the risk factors such as, you know, exercising more, walk a bit more, park your car a bit further away from the entrance, walk a bit, a few more steps, that will help. Uh, eating right, eating right means, you know, cutting down on all those uh, high fat content diets, okay? Um, it's basically you need to lower the risk of all the situation that might result in vascular condition. Um, of course, the first line treatment will be oral medication. Um, I don't need to talk too much. Uh, you know the blue pill, the yellow pill, the orange pill. What this pill does is that it causes nitric oxide, a very important messenger in our body, to relax the muscle in the penis. By relaxing the muscle in the penis, you allow more blood flowing through and that's how it helps with the problem of improving erection. What if medicine doesn't work? True enough, we know about 70% will have benefit from the medicine, but the remaining 30% unfortunately will need further help. So the second line treatment will be, you can use a vacuum constriction device as shown in this uh, picture or injection of a medication straight into the penis. Uh, of course, this will be more cumbersome, a bit difficult to carry out on a daily basis, but it works better than oral medicine. Uh, sometimes you can do combination treatment. Let's say, for example, you can use a vacuum constriction device on top of the oral medicine to improve the result of the oral medicine. What if all this fail? Well, we do have surgery. Unfortunately, this is really the uh, treatment of last resort. Was once you have done it, uh, you cannot reverse that. Uh, for this operation, what we are doing is to replace the penile muscle with an implant. So what happens is that your erection essentially has become a mechanical procedure. We have a, a, a palm that's buried inside your groin. There's an activating uh, uh, palm bulb that is uh, hidden inside your scrotum where you're supposed to be feel it. And when you want to have erection, you just need to press that. So the the, the saline water that's originally uh, embedded inside the pump will flow and fill up the cylinders that fill up the, the penal tissue and so you get reaction. Once the job is done, you just need to reactivate it again to let the saline water to flow back into the, the um, vascular reservoir so that uh, the penis will soften. So it works 100%, but essentially if you have this surgery done, there's no turning back. So if we look at it this way, there's oral medicine, there's a second line treatment, there's a third line treatment, there's nothing in between. Say, for example, if I don't want to do injections, I feel that the vacuum device is too cumbersome. I don't want to proceed with implant because it's really like the last resort. But oral medicine doesn't work for me or it works, but not fantastic. 
what else are there well for many years there's not much of option to be frank but recently we have minimally invasive treatment like endovascular approach which will be elaborated later on by my colleague now this will be the end of my talk today uh if you have any further question please do give us a tinkle uh, we'll answer all of them at the end of this webinar thank you